Uh, Josh, um, you and I have um, done a phone interview previously, but now I'm here in Lock Haven where we can talk on video about your rather extraordinary experience in this entire case involving Aaron Fisher. Let's talk about why your story is relevant. Where we're sitting here right now, right behind you, is where Aaron and Don used to live during the time period in which the allegations allegedly occurred, as well as during the investigation. Is that true? Correct. And tell us about the nature of your relationship with the Fishers before there were any allegations against Jerry Sandusky. Um, we were actually quite neighborly, quite neighborly. Uh, we would hang out quite often right around in here in the evenings. And just have call, casual conversations. Now, were you, cons were you friendly? Con yeah, we were friends. And obviously you live literally right next door to them. I mean, your houses are joined, yes. quite literally. So you would, when you're that close to somebody as a neighbor, you get to know what's going on, whether you like it or not, right? Correct. And <clears throat> during the time period of 2006 to late 2008 when this abuse is alleged to have occurred did you ever have any suspicions at all that something weird was going on with with Aaron Fisher nothing you never had any indication that he seemed like a, a, a kid that had, had something really bad going on in his no, life he was he was arrogant but he was normal right. and I believe you told me he was also very physically Fit. I mean, he yeah. was a wrestler. Yeah. He used to, I had a friend, his name was Daryl. He would actually literally wrestle him right out in the front yard and get the best of it at the time, a 28-year-old man. And this would have been during the time period uh, around the time of the abuse. Right. And so, now occasionally you would see Jerry Sandusky. Is that accurate? Yeah, I'd see him pull up right where you're parked. And was there anything weird that you no. noticed? Nope, he'd pull up, Aaron would run out, get in. Aaron would run out and get in, and then maybe a couple days later, come back. Did you know who Jerry Sandusky no, was? No, no, I heard of him, but I didn't know who he was. So he wasn't this godlike figure that the media no, has. No, uh, at least not to me. Had, did you remember him as a Penn State no, coach? No. Did you care about Penn State football? No. Were, were the Fishers big Penn State football fans that you know of? Not really to speak of. I mean, they, they bragged about the second mile and getting this for free and that for free, but other than that, no. So, <clears throat> let's fast forward to late 2008, you believe. Sometime probably just after Halloween. Is that right around Halloween? Because yeah. you remember there being Halloween direct, uh, decorations yeah. up, which could have been a little after Halloween. Right. Uh, you and I have tried to piece it together and it seems like it was probably November right. of 2008 you see literally right where we're sitting right now yep, I was sitting here my ex-girlfriend was sitting there we didn't have a garden at the time and Dawn would be sitting right in front of her door behind me and we'd be sitting out here talking and what happened um, Aaron came through the yard right here with his friend Baron and told Dawn that he wanted to stay at Theron's house. This would have been Theron Mock. Correct. One of the boys that would have been in the car accident with Aaron a few years later. Right. Mm -hmm. And Don had told him, no, you're not going with, you're not going there. I have Katie going here, Eric going there. She called him Bubby. I have your bubs going here and you're going with Jerry. I have a special night out coming and you're not effing that up for me. You're not effing that up for me. Right. My special night out. Yep. Now, was it common for Don to go out for special nights? Here and there, yeah. I mean, she was a partier, wasn't she? Yeah. She liked to drink. Correct. Okay, and so your impression was that Aaron had been basically jettisoned to go with Jerry Sandusky, and that Don was not going to let Aaron get out of that and mess up her special night. Right. So did Aaron say, okay, fine, or what happened? No, he had an argument with her here in the yard that uh, ended up, I don't remember word for word, but it ended up being, well, I'm not going with him, he makes me feel weird. And then that's when she was like, what do you mean? Well, he, he creeps me out. She goes, well, I need more to go on than that. You need to tell me more than that. 
And at that point, I think that's about the time that they went into the house and come back out maybe a half an hour to an hour later. By then we were inside. She came in and she's like, I'm gonna own that motherfucker's house. I'm gonna own that motherfucker's house, meaning whose house? Jerry Sandusky's. And what was your reaction at the time when you heard that? I told her, I said, he was just trying to get out of going. You know, don't you think that he was just saying stuff to get out of going? And how did she respond to that? She said, oh, well, things were said that you didn't hear. Well, it's certainly possible. Right. Except that immediately after this, it takes quite a long time for Aaron to actually allege any sort of sexual activity. Are you, right. are you aware of that? Right. And during that time period, I've rarely seen him out. So my, my point here is, let's pretend that your perception was accurate, that Aaron was just trying to get out of a night with Jerry Sandusky, because he was, you know, they'd been together, they'd been going, you know, as friends together for a couple of years, and Jer at this point, Aaron's almost 15 years old, he's into girls, he probably doesn't want to be hanging out with this old guy. That could all be true, and he's just looking for a way to get out of it. It's not working. By the way, they, they put up quite a, this was a longer conversation, right? More than just a couple of seconds. Right, right. It was a pretty good argument right here. So it wasn't as if immediately Aaron decides, I'm going to pull the, he makes me uncomfortable card. Right. Uh, it took a while before yeah. he finally did that, right? Yeah. So let's pretend that they go inside and he spills all the goods. My mom, he's been sexually abusing me, oral sex and all that. That might make some sense if she comes back out and says... She did tell us that, you know, we didn't hear what was said, but that he's nothing, nothing, I guess, uh, what would you call it? There's been touching, but nothing penetrating or all that. So in other words, like inappropriate touching. Yeah. So she, that, it was that night that she says yeah. that? Yeah. After she says, I'm going to own that motherfucker's yeah. house. So that's interesting. Okay, so she admits to you that he hasn't said anything of a quote-unquote sexual nature, but that she's going to own Jerry Sandusky's house. Correct. And then just to be clear, to further substantiate that he didn't spill all the beans when he went inside the house, it takes quite a long time before he starts to allege that to anybody. Correct. Several months, as a matter of fact, and including a police interview where he says nothing about sexual activity. Are you aware of that? No. Okay. Well, that's the fact. I mean, his first police interview, and I've spoken to the police officer, he says nothing about it. And that happens several months after this conversation you have in what is likely November of 2008. So what, what was your general impression of what occurred that night at the time? At the time, were you buying it? Were you saying... I just thought he was saying whatever he needed to say to get out of going with Jerry. And in, and in retrospect, do you see this as the genesis of this entire quote-unquote scandal? That this is, the, this is the moment that it all, the snowball begins? I didn't see that at first, but now I do. <clears throat> and why do you see that now? Well, after reading a little bit more into it, I see that, you know, he's the one that started the whole thing and that the other accusers just followed suit with him. And do you believe that he was telling his mother that night that he had been sexually abused by Jerry no, Sandusky? I don't think he was saying he was sexually abused. That just that, you know, that some touching went on and that he felt creepy. And do you believe that when Dawn comes out of the house and says, I'm going to own that motherfucker's house, do you believe that this was the beginnings of her seeing this as a way... As a big dollar sign. ...to get out of this neighborhood? Mm -hmm. And what was Don's economic? I mean, obviously, this is this is um, this is a, a, I guess government-assisted uh, housing here, right? Yeah. What was Don's financial situation during this time period? Um, she lived solely off of SSI, child support, and welfare. And she was also almost evicted a couple of times, correct? Correct. And how do you know this? Oh, uh, she was she was telling us. And this was during the time period of the investigation, right. after this conversation that you were part of or heard, literally right. feet away. So she's got money problems. Right. And the first thing she says to you is, I'm going to own that MFers house. Mm -hmm. 
And was that the only time she ever mentioned money in relation to this case? No, it was always, we're going to buy a house in the country with room for the dogs to roam. Aaron was talking about buying sports cars and Jeeps. and It was always something. And this was at what time period? This was after that conversation that you overheard. Right. But before... After be the black cars started coming. The black cars? Yeah, the, the black Crown Vicks. What's that? The I... unmarked, like investigators cars or whatever oh okay so this was after people start interviewing him who come in these mysterious cars mm -hmm. but before it's public correct correct and so um, and they're talking about where they're gonna live he's gonna talk about he's talking about what cars he's gonna get um, and what are you thinking during this time period and it's grimy just that it's grimy that you know she's following through with this but I, I, I still felt okay about it because I thought somebody's going to see through the bullshit and it's going to get dropped. So you're thinking there's no way she's going to get away with this? Right. All right. And so when the crap hits the fan and you start to... I seen Jerry get arrested on TV. And what are you thinking? Okay, now maybe I should come forward and tell him what I know. <laughs> because you're thinking this, this can't be right. Right. Did you immediately know that Aaron was part of that or just presume it because... It's too much of a coincidence. Well, no, she had, by this point, whenever he was arrested, she had moved out of here and moved like three blocks that way. Mm -hmm. She said that they told her that she had to get a job and update her public uh, perception. They told her she needed to get a job because she was going to be a witness in a case. Right. And this made it would make her look better than as a welfare mom. Right. So she moved out And of she here. told you this? Yeah. Dawn told you this? Yeah. Okay. So she got a job, moved out, moved down the road here a little bit. And then right before all the shit hit the fan, she stopped by to say hi to the old neighbors. And she met one of them today. Or to the new neighbors, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And to tell me, keep your mouth shut. You're going to have reporters at your door. You're going to have this. People are going to want to be talking. Don't tell them where I live. I'll make it worth your while. I'll make it worth your while. Right. And how did you interpret that? I don't know, maybe she was going to pay me or something. I, Did, I, it, was made, it was made almost to be like a joking thing. You know? Well, it seems like it's kind of her M.O. to say things that are half joking, half true, so that she has plausible deniability. Is that is that accurate? Yeah. In other words, hey, keep your mouth shut. I'll make it worth your while. Ha, ha, ha. So you get the point, but if anyone calls her on it... Hey, I was just joking. Hey, I was just joking. How did you take it at the time? Well, I took her serious that she didn't want bothered by the reporters and, the, mm -hmm. you know, all that. So I was like, well, okay, whatever. And then there was just so many knocking on my door looking for her. And the people that just moved in weren't fully in yet. So they weren't home to be bothered. So by the time that the New York Times had got here, I was so fed up with answering the door saying she don't live there no more, she don't live there no more, that I finally gave in and told them where she was. Now, the New York Times reporter interaction with you is very interesting because you get quoted in a story about Aaron Fisher, among other people, um, that is a very sympathetic article towards Aaron Fisher. Okay. And, and, uh, and in fact, you're quoted in a way that seems to bolster the narrative that Aaron was telling the truth because you, you indicate that you had seen some golf clubs that Jerry had given to Aaron, and that's the only thing that the New York Times seems to be interested in that you said. Right. I had said to the New York Times that he was bragging about getting all these free things, and he's like, I even got a brand new set of golf clubs, and I don't even play golf. That's what Aaron had said about Jerry. Mm -hmm. By the way, I, my understanding is they were not brand new, but okay, <clears throat> whatever. But the, the point is that's how you were quoted in the New York right. Times. I um, even told him, I said, I think this whole thing's bullshit. You told the New York Times you think the whole thing is bullshit. Right. Did that appear in the article? No. Nope. How did the New York Times reporter respond to you when you said that? Well, he quickly wrapped up his uh, question of me and moved on down the street to her place, where he, he later came back and told me he was chased off by her dogs. So, just to be clear, you tell the New York Times reporter, as Aaron Fisher's neighbor, that you think this whole thing is bullshit, and he immediately stops questioning you and leaves. Mm -hmm. And what was your interpretation of that? He did help me, though. He got me in touch with Joe Amadola. Okay. So he that's interesting. That aspect. All right. And that's Jerry's defense attorney. Right. But 
Was it pretty clear to you that he had no interest in that line of, of narrative? Right. He was not interested in that element no. of the story? No. Um, so... He was more interested in something about a track coach or something. Well, he did actually speak to a track coach. Um, and that's a whole other interesting element of that story because that track coach got fired because allegedly he got too close to Aaron Fisher. Um, and I'm, I'm a little mystified as to how the New York Times decided to take the, t the slant on that that they did, but I'm mystified by a lot of things in this case. So let's go back to your situation. So the New York Times reporter gives you Joe Amendola's information. You contact Joe Amendola, correct? Mm -hmm. And what happens then? He said, I'm a little busy. Um, well, no, the first couple of times I called, I, I got an answer machine. And then I finally got a response back from him. And at that point, he was too busy dealing with the case. But he, he said he was going to send out an investigator, or his private eye or whatever. And that's who I had met with. And I can't remember the name of the guy. but mm -hmm. um, So I gave him all the information. And then I heard back from Joe a couple of times. I even told Joe over the phone the entire sequence of events. And oddly enough, I wasn't even asked half the stuff in court. And I told Joe the only way I was going to court is if I was subpoenaed. And they actually subpoenaed me. So you get subpoenaed, and we'll get back to Joe Mandola in a minute. What happens between the time that you get subpoenaed and the time you actually testify in this case? My car got keyed and tires got slashed. Do you remember how soon it was after you got subpoenaed? Less than a week. Less than a week after you get subpoenaed, your tires get slashed and your car gets keyed. Right. That, that was my caliber, my Dodge caliber. Any? Uh, did you have any doubt at the time that those two events were connected? I didn't have any problems with anybody else. So you you presumed that this had to be right. Aaron Fisher or someone close to him? Right. Did you do anything about it? I just called the police and I had no proof, so I had to be dropped. Did you tell them that you suspected Aaron Fisher? Yeah, but like I said, I had no proof. With no proof, there's okay. nothing that can be done. Well, it's an amazing coincidence, yeah. obviously. So we go on now to the trial, and you don't meet Joe Amendola until the day of your testimony, correct? I don't meet him face to face until that day. And you told him about the conversation that you witnessed where Aaron says to his mom, he makes me uncomfortable, I don't want to go out with him. Right. And everything that transpired after that, the whole business of, I'm going to own that motherfucker's house. And does Joe ask you about that at trial? Nope. He told me, he says, just answer what I ask and what the prosecution asks, that's it. We'll get back to that later. And were you shocked when Joe never asked you about that when you took the stand? When I took the stand, no. I thought that he had something bigger in mind that I'd be getting called back to the stand. That I never ended up getting called back. Next thing you knew... It was over. He was guilty. Off to jail he goes. Were you shocked? Then I was, yeah. Because you felt like, wait a minute, I, I was right here at the beginning of this whole thing. But then I thought, well, maybe it wasn't all of Aaron's doing it. Maybe it was the other guys, too. Well, I think a lot of people thought that, but do you now understand yeah. the significance of Aaron's story? Right. Which is what? That he's basically the start, the keystone, the entire thing. Right, because for two years he's the only accuser, and he's used by the prosecution to get to other accusers after a very long investigation that resulted in nothing. All right, so let's go back. So Joe Amendola doesn't ask you any of the key questions that you're expecting. In fact, it's, it's, I think it's only it's a very short testimony you give, correct? Yeah, really short. And you thought fairly insignificant. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about how the prosecution handled you. You also met with Joe McGettigan. Yeah. He, is a, he was the, uh, the prosecutor on the case, and he brings a police officer, right? Yeah. So he and a police officer interview you. By the way, how did you feel about the fact that a police officer was there when he interviewed you? It was kind you? of intimidating. Did you feel like that was the purpose? Yeah. That you would be intimidated? Yep. So this prosecutor, Joe McGettigan, and a police officer interview you, and what did you feel like that was their objective in interviewing you? To either get me to change my story or to think differently. And how did they do that? Through making it seem like, um, making it seem like, I had, there was two different ways I could have looked at it. 
And so they, they were basically trying to give you alternative scenarios for what you had perceived. Right. Did you feel like they were trying to manipulate your position on this case? Yeah, a little bit. Did you get, what was your, just give me your sense of Joe McGettigan. Uh, he seemed pretty snakish. He seemed like a snake? Yeah. Why did he seem like a snake? That's just how he came off to me. In what way? What did he do? It was the intimidation method, the, you know, couldn't, you, couldn't it also be correct that this happened, that happened, just trying to get me to change my entire way of thinking of it. Did that work? No. In retrospect, I mean, if you felt that way at the time, do you feel more strongly about that now, less strongly? I mean, how is, what is your perception I'm of that? equally opposed to the guy. Because you think that he saw you as the enemy as opposed to just trying to figure out what the hell, what, what happened right. here. Because the prosecutor's job is supposedly to get to the truth, regardless of whether it's for the prosecution or the defense. Right. But you didn't feel that that was what he was trying no. to do. I think he was just trying to evaluate me to see how much of a threat I was. And going back to Joe Mandola, I mean, I like Joe Mandola. I think he was under very difficult circumstances and under a lot of stress. But your story doesn't paint him in a very good light. Do you do you feel as if Joe deserves some blame? I think he dropped the ball. And why do you think he dropped the ball? Well. I wasn't asked half the questions I thought I should have been, and had I been asked those questions, I think a little bit more doubt would have been put in some people's minds. What kind of questions do you wish you had been asked? What did you witness that night? What did you hear? You know, those types of questions. Not, do you know Dawn? What kind of person do you think she is? Is she a good mother? <laughs> and they never even, did they even get to the financial elements of Aaron talking about what cars got, he's going to yeah, buy? Yeah, they said, well, what kind of statements has Aaron made? And I said about the, he'll have a fast car and a Jeep. And then what did Dawn say? Oh, she'll have a big white house in the country with a fence with room for the dogs to roam. That by was way, it. By the way, how has it turned out? He's got his sports car and his Jeeps, and she's got her house with room for the dogs to roam. And a Porsche, too. And a Porsche now. Right, we'll get to that more in a second. Let's go back to the, the original night. Because in the book that Aaron and Don and their, their therapist write, they tell a, a, a tale that doesn't seem to jive with your version of what happened, okay. uh, where they say that immediately they went on the uh, computer to check Megan's Law uh, website to see if Jerry was a sex offender. They did do that, not that night, though. They did not. And they also didn't... Not that I'm aware of, anyway, they, they, because she was over here asking to use my Wi-Fi. Right, because her computer wasn't working, she right? She didn't pay the bill. She, she couldn't pay the cable bill to get the internet. Okay. So she was using what little bit of network she had on her BlackBerry, and then, of course, borrowing my Wi-Fi. Okay. So at least the night that this all allegedly came to light to her, that, that did not happen. And you know it because they had to come to your house. Right. Because you had internet and they didn't. Right. Let's talk about the internet in a larger scheme, though. It, is it your experience or your knowledge that that Don was spending a lot of time on the internet, both trying to find out about Jerry Sandusky as well as messaging people about right. Jerry she Sandusky? She was always out here sitting um, on her BlackBerry on some sort of website talking to people about it. I don't know who she was talking to or where she was at on the internet, but she had said that she's been talking to several people with the same scenarios. She told you this. Right. So she, that she's been talking to people on the internet who had similar scenarios to her and, and Aaron with Jerry Sandusky. Right. You don't happen to so remember. She, she even said about a previous allegation that basically went downhill and he was acquitted of or something. Really? Now that sounds an awful lot like 1998's episode. I don't know how much you know about the case. I don't case. know nothing about it. Well, that's very interesting. Do you happen to remember approximately what, what time period, what year this might have been when she would have been doing this? It was right after he made that allegation. So this would have been 2009-ish? Yeah. yeah. Maybe 2010? Right. Somewhere in there? You don't right. happen to remember what time of year it was. Was it summer? It was fall. It was fall. See, that's very interesting because... It's starting to get cold. All right. Well, who knows? Because one of the key periods here is September of 2010 where rumors start to percolate. I can, I can see that being around the time frame. It could have been September of 2010. Yeah. See, because I, 
I, I believe that Don was creating an echo chamber on the internet that created rumors that some, a couple reporters started to pick up, started to ask questions about. Um, when in fact, what was really happening was Don desperately wanted Aaron to get, uh, or Jerry to get arrested because she had money problems. Speaking of the money problems, and... She, she made that comment once, I really wish this would hurry the hell up. I could use that money. And she not only said, I could use that money, I wish they would, this would hurry up, didn't she joke about how she was going to get yeah. the money? Yeah, there's a there's a TV commercial in this area that they, they, they sing a song, it's my money and I want it now. She had joked about calling them. And getting money based upon a future lawsuit, set lawsuit against Jerry Sandusky right. or the Second Mile or whoever. Whoever. And how did you take that at the time? I just laughed it off. Okay, so Jerry gets convicted. <clears throat> the story goes away for the large part until I get in touch with you, I guess, right? Right. Um, which I'm, I'm guessing that you, you're, you're probably not very happy you, that I got in touch with you at this point, are you? Wish I wouldn't have. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm sorry about that, but I appreciate you willing, being willing to tell your version of the truth here. So we do an interview. Um, it goes public. It goes public. What was the reaction to that? Um, from who? Like the public? Just in general. Uh, in general, I mean, a lot of people are like, wow. Other people still take his side. There wasn't a lot of reaction at first. Not a lot of reaction at first. Okay. And then, since then, I've done several other posts on Aaron. Other people have talked. They've been circulated quite a bit, especially in this community. Before we get specifically to what's happened to you, what's your sense of how this community views Aaron and his story? That he's a liar. You're confident about that? Yeah. That that's, within Lock Haven, you feel like that's almost universal? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure he has his believers here and there, but... And why do you think people have come to that conclusion about Aaron in his neighborhood? Because of the way he acts since everything. Which is what? That he's still arrogant and acts like nothing ever happened. I mean, a victim of abuse would be, you know, I don't know, just more, more withdrawn. He doesn't act like a victim of abuse. No. He's very arrogant, very cocky. Right. Uh, he's been threatening people including me, including you, mm -hmm. um, and, and you believe, and I tend to agree with you, that he's been vandalizing your cars. Is correct. that correct? Correct. So a few weeks, I don't know, at this point, I guess it was about a month or so ago, around the time that I start posting new information about Aaron, what happens to your cars? I've had an acid-like substance poured on the hood. I've had scratches. My gas cap completely removed and taken. Um, just childish behavior. And at one point, there was a, a... He actually drove by, slowed down, laughed, and then drove off really fast. Aaron Fisher did? Yeah, in his blue Mustang. Just happened to be after your car had been vandalized? Right. The next morning? Next day? Next day. That's more than a coincidence, right? Yeah. Marin would have no reason to be driving by here, right? Right. Unless he's checking out the old neighborhood. I don't know. And you've seen Aaron drive past where you were several times since this occurred, correct? Right. Not just here, where I've been. And Dawn, his mother as well, right? Yep. She saw your damaged car at a gas station and said what? Nice car, faggot. Does that sound like the mother of an abuse victim? No. Uh, uh, um, so, is there any doubt in your mind that Aaron is in some way responsible for the damage to your cars? I, I believe it. Can't prove it, but I believe it. The state police have been in touch with you, correct? Correct. And do you think they believe it's Aaron? Yes. As a matter of fact, they think that he's intimidating a witness in a, in a criminal case. Correct. correct. Now, as far as we know, they've not made contact with him yet, but they have promised to do so. Is that accurate? Yes. Do you think that'll change Aaron's behavior? I hope. Yeah, you just want done with this. Uh, yeah. So you've, you've had to sell one of your cars, correct? Yep. And you've got the other one at least partially fixed. Partially. But you're concerned it's still going to get vandalized. Yes. Especially after this goes public. Especially after this interview goes public? Yes. Well, maybe we'll wait a while and see if the state police can intimidate Aaron a little bit before we do that. Because um, I don't want to see this happen to you yet again. Um, but... 
uh, the reality is that you have endured an enormous amount of hardship here, yet you're still willing to tell your story. Yep. Why is that? So that justice can be done. And, and why don't you believe justice was done here? Well, I, I can't vouch for what the other accusers said, but I know at least in Aaron's case, he's lying. And you believe that that's a, potentially a key to the whole case? Yeah. What degree of confidence do you have that Aaron's lying about his story? Scale 1 to 100%. 100%. 100%. Yeah, just because of what I've seen here and the way that his mom and him were. And of course, the way he's reacting to you... It, it tells me he's worried that what I'm going to say is going to catch on, I guess. Yeah, if he had nothing to worry about, he wouldn't care. Why, why would you put yourself in that kind of criminal jeopardy to intimidate a witness in your case? Right. That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And Dawn driving around in a Porsche, which you've seen around town numerous times. Right. What is your, your take on that? That's just arrogant. And how does she even get to have a Porsche? She wasn't the one that was supposedly abused. Well, not only was she not supposedly abused, let's pretend that Aaron's story is correct for a second. So for three years under her watch, while she's going out drinking, she's feeding her son her, her, to a predator. To a predator. And a few years later, she's so guilt-free, she's willing to drive around in a, in a pretty nice Porsche. Right. Does that make any sense? No. I mean, what, what mom, you got a lot of kids, you're a dad. What mom or dad, but especially a mom, if everything was true, you would wouldn't, you wouldn't do that? There's no way. The other thing that I've always found interesting is her reaction to me. If you're that mom, right, and someone's telling you you weren't the worst mom in the world, you didn't let your son get abused for three years under your watch while you went out drinking, wouldn't you want to find out at least what I'm saying? Wouldn't you? I mean, you would want what I was saying to be true. Right. Instead of attacking me. Didn't that make sense? Yeah, but if, if what you're saying is true, then her money goes bye-bye. Well, in an, in an ideal world it does, but we don't necessarily live in that world in this case, because this case is totally different. Um, so, is there, is there anything else that you think people need to know about, about this situation, your relationship with them, what you've witnessed? Is this, is this, how amazing is this whole thing to you? When you think back to that conversation that you witnessed back well, in late 2008. I just want it all to be over with and done and justice to be served. And the real amazing part is that he's dumb enough to continue to come after my vehicles. I mean, to do it over and over again, that's gutsy. And by the way, one time he left a note or somebody left yes. a note. Yes, that so, I need to quit talking to certain people and my stuff will look better. Now, some people close to Aaron think that note was too well written to be written by him. It might have been his mom. I don't care who it was written by. I just want it all to stop. All right. Well, I appreciate you, you having the courage to, to tell your story. I'm sorry that this has all happened the way that it has. Hopefully, someday, as you say, justice will be done. Right. Um, but thank you for, for telling your story. I appreciate it.